Okay, this is the last talk of this session. Uh, so, Konal Marwaha is going to talk about the power of non-standard quantum oracles. Uh, so, Konal, please go ahead. Stage is yours. Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Konal. I'm a student at University of Chicago. Um, this is joint work with Ruzvi Basirian and my advisor, Bill Pfefferman. So, I'll break this into two parts. I'll talk about the motivation for about half the talk and then talk about some results. Feel free to stop me if you have any questions. So when we talk about complexity theory, we're often talking about a set of tasks that require similar amounts of resources, like time or space. For example, P is the number, is the class of tasks that require polynomial amount of resources with the input size. And NP is the amount that you can check with that much resource. But it's often very hard to prove that two classes are different. For example, P versus NP is still unknown. In fact, P versus another class known as P space is still unknown. We still don't know if those two are equal or unequal. Of course, we think they're unequal. So in, in lieu of this, we often talk about a simpler thing to do to show that two complexity classes are different. We use this idea of oracles. So you can consider a complexity class with access to an extra resource, O, you know, we'll call it an oracle. And when we're measuring the complexity, we'll also measure the number of calls to O. For example, a polynomial size machine, a polynomial time machine might also uh, allow a polynomial number of accesses to this oracle O. And the reason they're useful is because proving that two complexity classes are different with access to this oracle restricts the kinds of proof techniques you can use to show that the two classes are equal in real life. So th there's a lot of different ways you could, you know, use an oracle or query an oracle. And so in quantum computing, you know, there's even more options than there were before. Maybe the oracle is computing some classical function f. So uh, what has been, you know, come to call the standard oracle takes in, you know, a st uh, basis state xz and outputs um, the output of this function xor to the z register. There's also, you know, a notion of an in-place oracle where x is mapped to some f of x. And of course, f has to be invertible here. But notice there are no control bits. You know, maybe also the oracle can be some arbitrary unitary. So you take any state and it applies a unitary on that state. There's more options. Oracles could be random on every application. They could you could have access to the inverse, you might not. But you have a lot of freedom in choosing this magic box. Oh. So I'll give you an example. There's these two classes uh, people call QCMA and QMA. QMA is the set of decision problems that for every yes instance, there's some uh, witness, some quantum witness that given to the BQP machine, given to the quantum computer, will make it accept with at least probability two thirds. But if the answer is no, then nothing, no witness that is given to the BQP machine, we'll figure it out. By contrast, QCMA is the same setup, but where the witness is a polynomial length bit string. So what we've done is we've taken the definition of QMA, which has a quantum witness, and now we're using a classical witness. So the question here is, you know, does quantum, does a quantum witness give you more power in verifying computation with a quantum computer? And we, th we think the answer, I mean, it depends who you ask, you know, I think the answer is yes, they're different. But roughly this question comes down to, are all ground states of local Hamiltonians 
efficiently describable. So if we wanted to prove that QCMA is different than QMA, we could try using an Oracle because if we tried to do it in real life, it would, you know, it would separate P and P space, which as I said, is, you know, still a major open question, maybe even too hard. So you might try, okay, let's try using a quantum Oracle. So this has been done by Aronson and Cooperberg. If you have the Oracle be a kind of finding, reflecting over a random quantum state, then a quantum witness will help you, but a classical witness can't. You could also talk about a randomized in-place Oracle. Here, when I say randomized, you can think about a quantum channel. So it's running an in-place operation, but choosing that function randomly. So, you know, the, for example, the, the process of inverting a permutation, we can say, you know, can be done with QMA, but not with QCMA in this Oracle. And I'll, I'll note that there's no proof that the QCMA and QMA are different, even with a standard Oracle, although there are, there's recent progress in some new types of Oracles, and there's some links here. So what's the power of an Oracle? Um, what we'll do in this project is uh, we'll talk about property testing problems on a graph. So if we're given a graph G, we want to know if the G has some property or G is far from some property. And we'll encode the adjacency list of G in an Oracle. So if we have a promise on G, it'll translate to a promise on the Oracle. So now we'll give this Oracle um, to a complexity class and we'll see how, well, how the complexity of this problem is. Importantly, what we're studying is how the choice of the Oracle model affects the QCMA versus QMA complexity. So in this talk, we'll be talking about different Oracle models, but the same underlying question of property testing question. And we'll ask, you know, does the problem, how does the problem change in difficulty, you know, when encoded in these different oracles? For example, sometimes a quantum witness is needed. Sometimes a classical witness is enough. And in fact, sometimes the problem is not even possible to solve in polynomial amount of queries. Questions so far? So I'll move on to the results section. So I'll split it into three parts. Um, again, we're looking at the same property testing problem and we're gonna encode it in different oracles and see when quantum witnesses succeed, when classical witnesses fail and when no witnesses seem to work at all. So the problem we'll choose is we'll take a graph and we're gonna ask if it's disconnected or it's an expander. So we're gonna take a regular graph. We can represent it, let's say with um, permutations. And we wanna know if the graph, you know, is basically is two parts or it's an expander. Now why expander? So if we look at the graph Laplacian, and you're disconnected, you're gonna have a degeneracy at your lowest eigenvalue of the graph Laplacian, or for example, your highest, value, highest eigenvalue of the adjacency matrix. But expanders won't have degeneracy at that extremal eigenvalue. In fact, they'll have a spectral gap and we'll end up being able to test for this with a quantum protocol. So once we've chose our problem, we're going to encode G, encode, encode this graph into an Oracle and ask about whether a QCMA or QMA-like machine can solve uh, this problem that's kind of encoded in the Oracle. So for many of these Oracles, uh, Oracle models, there is a quantum algorithm. 
the algorithm is you can measure in the Hadamard basis and you reject if you get the all one state or the uniform superposition state. And the second thing you can do is run a primitive we're calling the spectral test, which will fail according to this graph Laplacian. Recall that you know if, if the graph is disconnected, then there will be multiple eigenvectors of the graph Laplacian that have eigenvalue zero. One of them is the all one state or the uniform superposition state. I've denoted lambda one, but there's another lambda two eigenvector, which has uh, zero eigenvalue. By contrast, expanded graphs have a very large spectral gap. And so this, if the first one passes, the second one will pass with some probability bounded away from one. So what, what is the spectral test? So it depends exactly on the Oracle model you're using, but you can think about the spectral test as comparing O psi with psi, kind of like a Hadamard test. For example, with an in-place Oracle, if you look at O psi minus psi and look at the norm of that difference, it's proportional to the graph Laplacian, at least psi LG psi. So we build a spectral test for many Oracle models, the standard model, the in-place model, um, with and without randomization, so uh, unitaries or channels. And so with one query, we can, we can succeed um, on this spectral test, or yeah, we can succeed on this spectral test and we're able to detect if we have an extremal eigenvector. So, this graph non-expansion question or testing graph expansion encoded in the Oracle is in, uh, is in QMA for many of these Oracle models. Questions? Okay. So now I'll talk about when classical witnesses fail. So before, I started, I want to talk about randomized oracles. You can think of randomized oracles like quantum channels, because I will probabilistically apply unitary on every application. And so why we study these quantum channels is because it can make the algorithm easier to analyze and lower bounds easier to prove because the algorithm can depend on fewer things. And I'll show you what I mean. So previously we were testing for graph non-expansion and a randomized version of this problem is sort of like testing for a non-expanding subset. So if you imagine lots of graphs that are disconnected in a certain spot, you can imagine like that disconnected spot is a particular subset of big N. For example, either there's a set, you know, V such that it always is invariant under all the permutations of the graph, or you know, we look over all graphs and the the pi i's from the graph, the adjacency list is chosen kind of randomly. And so this is the you know the randomized version of you know disconnected or expander that we'll be looking at. So the proof technique here is using representation theory. So what we'll be able to say is that these quantum channels or randomized oracles project in the symmetric subspace. Um, there's a nice uh, paper by Aram Harrow that sort of surveys some of this work, you know, church of the symmetric subspace. What this projector does is it allows us to analyze the action of this Oracle, this randomized Oracle on any quantum state. The intuition here is that there are so many choices of V, so many possible V that no classical witness will be able to describe it. Remember big N is two to the little n. So we're able to show that, you know, uh, BQP machines can't 
um, find this set V or you know, decide between yes and no cases, even when given a classical witness for the in-place oracle. I will say there are some restrictions based on the number of work qubits you can use when, when um, querying the oracle. It's related to the choice of norm we're studying in the problem, like a trace distance norm versus a diamond norm. You might ask, you know, what about other Oracle models? You know, can we do this? Uh, can we have some sort of lower bound in this sense? And I will say, if you consider the standard Oracle, then actually this problem is in QCMA, the way I've set this up. And it's related to abelian versus non-abelian symmetries. So in the standard Oracle, you are XORing your output and XOR is abelian. And these groups are e much easier to characterize. And there's, um, they have a lot more structure. But for the in-place oracle, the input is being mapped directly to the output. And so this kind of permutation can form some non-abelian symmetries. Great. So the last section I want to talk about is when no witnesses work at all. So here I want to introduce this model of a phase oracle where we're sending a state to the output, you know, we're sending X to its output, but encoded in a phase. And note that this is sort of different than if I had control qubits. If I had control qubits, you know, and control qubits, I'd actually recover the standard oracle. So here I've restricted the, stand, the control qubits for illustration. Now in this model, if I have a randomized oracle or quantum channel, this will end up adding a random phase to the state. And we can show that this quantum channel is depolarizing. How depolarizing? In fact, the yes and no instances are one over, inverse, or one over exponentially close. In, in statistical distance. And so what happens is actually there's no witness that can help you solve the problem, no matter the type, if it's quantum or classical. The machine is always going to need an exponential number of queries to figure out the answer here. Now I said, okay, yeah, I removed the control qubits. Why'd this problem get so hard? Because for example, if you put the control qubits back, you have the same object as the standard Oracle. And so there's kind of a, a phase transition here. You know, when you have little O of N control qubits, we again show that there's no good witness. The channel depolarizes too quickly. But with N qubits in the control register, then this problem is in QCMA, as I mentioned before. So it would be nice to pinpoint the exact phase transition here. You know, what's making this problem so hard? Okay, with that, thanks. Um, hopefully I explained a bit about why choosing your Oracle model can lead to, you know, great differences in the complexity of a problem encoded within it. Okay, thank you so much, Kona. Uh, do we have questions? Uh, can you please come here, maybe, to, to ask the question? Okay, so thanks for the nice talk. Um, could you please turn to the open? The face face oracle page. Sure, one second.
Okay, sorry about that. Okay. The phase oracle you said? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. So, uh, the you said the the phase transition. There is a phase transition, and uh, I'm wondering if this is related to some uh, about pseudo random states problem because uh, you can see that with a, a phase oracle you can actually prepare uh, things like uh, uh, with a random with a random f you can prepare a pseudo random state. So I think, uh, do you think there is a relation between them? Yeah, I think it's possible. Um, yeah, I don't know why the number of control qubits has such an impact. In general, I think when using kind of a random function here, what you're doing is you're turning this unitary into a channel and the channel is sort of, um, has a lot of less structure than that a quantum algorithm can use. So maybe that's also related to the pseudo randomness. Okay, thank you. Sure. Do we have more questions? Yeah, maybe I can ask this um, general question. Uh, is it uh, how hard would be, or is it possible even to design circuits which actually perform the action of these oracles? Yeah, that's a good question. So, when the oracle implements, let's say, a random, you know, permutation, you know, involving the adjacency list of a graph, remember that the graph is exponentially sized. So we need to describe it in, you know, if you want the oracle to be efficient, then you'll have to describe it in polynomial time. And so you'll have to describe an exponential number of, you know, edges in polynomial amount of time or, and there's only so many graphs that we can do this with. You know, we have plenty of constructions of graphs that are, you know, they call it doubly explicit. So these are graphs that you can describe very succinctly, but most uh, graphs, you know, most functions of that size can't be compressed. Um, so especially the randomized oracles, I'm not sure how um, possible it is to build them in real life. Okay. Okay, thank you. And if there isn't any more questions, let's thank Gunal again. <laughs>